Hey guys, let's take a look at three locks that have been a source of endless frustration for me and this is really to show you the level of skill some of the challenge uh, lock man makers have put into these things. Um, the first one is by Corver15. I just got this open last night. I've had it for probably three months. A beautiful lock. He put almost as much effort into the face of this lock that looks like a demon face. I really wanted to open this one on Halloween, but it just didn't work out. I struggled with this until he sent me a tip uh, on email. He said, if you get a fault set, give up and start again. And I, I can't tell you how many hours I had trying to pick this three-pinned lock. So let's take a look at some of these pins. First of all, you, the first two here basically have little nibs on the bottom of them. So not a big deal, kind of like a T-pin, but then oddly below that little nib were little wafers. Now the third one is a little bit different. He has a, this is an Asa, one of the newer Asa, very sharp, beautiful little pin, and he had that little cutout facing down, but also with a wafer. Um, let's take a look at why that might be important. What I was getting by SP Ping was very deep fault sets and I couldn't go any further. Basically it would seize up and I just couldn't find anything to pick. Uh, with, you know, of course you got four empty chambers in there. And so when I finally did get it open, this is what I found. Now you'll notice on five of these we have these little side cuts. So no matter which way you pick it, uh, clockwise or counterclockwise, uh, you're going to have problems because the way this works is, let me grab this guy, when you would pick if I get the focus to work, when you would pick one of these, the way, now remember the wafer is below this, so when you would push it up through the chamber and the wafer would push to the edge of that shear line, allowing you to rotate, what would happen is that little nib would get caught in that machined out part. Now remember the wafer is still sitting in the chamber, so there's no way to pick through the wafer and even if you could there's no way to reach this pin because he's rotated away from that uh, that hole. Just impossible to get at. Hence the advice if you pick to a fault set you're hosed. And normally picking to a fault set is the first stop, a first step. After that it gets easy. On this one it means it's impossible. So I ended up picking this one by raking. Now let's take a look at the other pin. You'll notice that last pin was just a little bit different and you might think, oh no big deal because that's not even, there's no slot there because this is the pin that he used on the last one, on number six. But it is modified. If you look at the rear of the lock, you notice he drilled a couple of holes, and in effect, that countermilled that last hole. So if you manage to pick and get a fault set on that pin, that very sharp edge hooks up in that countermilling, and you're not going any further. So again, you're hosed if you get a fault set. Beautiful lock, very well executed, very nicely done. Core 15, I have to commend you. Gave me another one. This is a the same thing, except this is lock number one. It's uh, six pins, and it's also an Everest. So you got the safety pin on the bottom. Uh, the way this one feels, it's pinned exactly the same way, uh, but with the full six pins. I'm probably not going to be getting into this one anytime soon. The next lock that's really interesting comes from LOL. LOL is in Taylorsville, Utah. Uh, this is the key, by the way. I've been struggling with this one for a while. Um, let me take, give you a closer look at this. Now, you'll notice every one of those pins very shallow, and then there's a wafer, and then you have drunken spools, and then the springs. Now, when I took this apart, I'm not exactly sure where these six wafers went. I think I have them correct, because it appears that they were put in as spacers to cause, uh, create extra tension on the spring. I can't imagine that they would be on top of the drunken spool, so I put them the way that I believe that they came. What happened is when I dumped the springs, I found six extra wafers. But here's how this one works. You might think, well, we got all those wafers. It's going to be really easy because that creates an extra shear line before you get to the complexity of those drunken spools. And if it weren't for this next little modification, you'd be 100% right. Let's take a close look at the core. I want you to look at the work that has gone into this core. Just amazing what he has done here. Uh, this is actually a little plate that comes out and it also kind of flops around in there. I'm sure that's by design because if you pick to the false, there's only one correct shear line. If you pick to the wrong shear line 
or even the right shear line, this plate will move leading you to believe that you've actually picked that pin and it'll give you a false set. But then of course you've misaligned the holes and probably didn't help you a lot. But it leads you to believe that it did. Anyway, one, career, one correct shear line just like you'd have in like a best lock, but it doesn't give the advantages of having I mean, it doesn't make it any easier to pick just because it has those extras in there. Really cool lock. Difficult. I, I got a lot of faults sets on this. Very deep fault sets because these drunken spools just pivot wildly inside of those cylinders. I got this one open, again, by pure luck. I probably spent 20 or 30 hours just on this lock. And then on a whim, I grabbed my Sparrow's uh, uh, coffin keys, and I think it was this one. I just put him in and jiggled him around for a little while. And lo and behold, he popped open. Miracle. 99.99% luck. No skill involved in that one, fellas. I just got incredibly lucky. This key, or this lock, came with the key. I was able to look at it. Uh, he didn't hide it. Um, this is from Texas Jim. And this is kind of the thing you would expect from Texas Jim. It's a challenge lock. It's supposed to be hard to pick. High, high, low, high, low. You got a really low cut guarding. And I thought, wow, this is going to be not so difficult. But, let me show you what Texas Jim did to us here. First of all, every single pin is serrated, top and bottom. And then every single upper pin uh, has a floating pin on the inside of it. So let me show you why that's important. If you haven't put a lot of thought into it, where do those tweezers go? I've got one kind of set up here. So, floating pin. When you pick it, the bottom pin will push up and you reach the shear line and you, and you get the click and you believe you've picked it. As soon as you release tension, the key pin falls to the bottom of the core, but then the spring pushes that pin back and interferes with the shear line. So at some point, you're going to get a very, very deep fault set, but there are going to be six of these little nibs sticking down blocking your shear line. So you really have to pick 12 pins in order to or pick it 12 times. Six outer pins and then six inner pins. The only way this could have been more devious is if Texas Jim had counter mill or counterboard inside of the key pin. That would have been really dastardly. Thank goodness he didn't do it. Doesn't matter. I didn't get it picked. I had to use the key to open the core. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, he used serrated pins for a reason, and that is because he threaded each and every one of these six cylinders. So you get a lot of binding up, and you get a lot of lock seizing. Very difficult lock to get into. I did, as I said, I did not pick it. I had to use the key to gut it. I just got so frustrated after probably 40 or 50 hours. I just said, that's it. I'm going to, I'm going to open it. Um, anyway, fellas, sometimes you do need the stinking key. Anyway, thanks for your time. Stay safe, stay legal. LOL, Corver 15 in Texas Gym. Thank you, sir, for these incredible locks. What great skills you guys have. Thanks.